So thank you so much for joining us. We have a special guest with us today. Of course, you've all used Visa before. You may have used their card or paid them before. Um, very happy to have them here. So thank you, Sashi, for coming in to tell us your story. So specifically, that's, we're going to talk about networking today. And everybody has a different relationship with networking. It's love-hate and it's complicated. Your systems people don't want to admit that the network exists and the network folk want to count every single packet. And this is also the use case track. So we're not going to tell you that Docker is going to solve all your problems. We're going to talk about the Visa story and some of the challenges they had uh, and some of the unanticipated problems and resulting architecture that they ended up with. So before I start, though, we'll do a little story, a history of, an abridged history of networking. And yeah, that's a networking pun. I've got some more. So what networking is so challenging because it's distributed in nature. We, we have to manage and touch all these unique components that we talk to differently, that we configure differently, and don't talk to each other very well either. So who can provision a new VLAN or virtual network pretty much instantaneously by a show of hands? All right, we got like seven people. You guys are in the cloud, we get it. So who can do it for a new service maybe within a week? What about a month? Two months? We've got a lot of people who don't have their hands raised, and I'm scared to ask how long it's going to be. That's okay. That is the challenge of networking, and it's tough being a network engineer because sometimes these things are very, very difficult to manage in a cluster. See, it's because we speak a different language in networking. We speak in the language of subnets and IPs and CIDR, and that just doesn't work so well when we're deploying applications. Our goal is to deploy an application uniformly across the cluster while using all these discrete components. So Docker made everything better, right? Containers came along and everything just works in the network? Well, not quite. Because in a lot of ways, it made things worse. Because now, we have hundreds or thousands of containers per host, so we have a higher density, so we have more IPs and more MAC addresses in the network. We have containers that exist for minutes or months. And so containers coming up and down, developers that are deploying 100 times a day or more, just going nuts. And we also have microservices that are more horizontally distributed, adding more network traffic. This is all challenging. And this is worse. So we're in a worse situation. And we can't use the tools of yesterday and yesterday's networks to manage the containers today. It's just not going to work. And so back in Docker 1.7, which seems like an eternity ago, we came out with a construct called the container network model. And what this was is a contract. It's a contract between a network driver that does the heavy lifting for the network and Docker itself that is doing the scheduling for your container. And there are two very important principles with the container network model. One is put users and applications first. And what this actually means is we want to have portable networks that are defined in terms of our applications, not in terms of subnets and firewall rules and load balancing configurations. And it has to be portable so that it can be used in your cloud, on-prem, bare metal, VMware. And the second important thing was a plug-in API design. And that's because your networks are all very unique. They're all snowflakes, right? We have different constraints and different features that you have in your networks. And for that, we need different plug-in drivers that can accommodate that. So there's three more things that are important. One, it has to be scalable and secure. It has to be scalable, and we have to use algorithms that can allow for convergence in very quick times no matter how large the network is. And also secure by default which is the Docker mantra of securing everything by default so you actually use it. Support across OS ecosystems. This is critically important because you want to use your network, whether it's Linux or Windows or in the cloud or on-prem. So you need to have a portable network that works across operating systems. Lastly, it has to be easy so you use it and so you can deploy it. Docker manages your certs for you. you can do, we, we manage the certs on your... Uh, your control plane, across your data plane, on your networks, and then we're also managing the bring up of the control plane itself and everything that gets distributed across it. 
So what's now possible? So now we can describe everything about our application in a single file. Everything about the network and how the application uses the network. For instance, different tiers of applications that need different network policies or different features that they're using of the network like overlay encryption or the driver that they use. In addition to that, ingress and egress policies that are different for different applications, all described in a single file. And the result is that we have a multi-container, multi-tier, multi-node application that can be brought up and brought down. And what's Docker doing? It's managing your IP tables for you. It's managing the load balancer for you. It's managing all these pieces without you having to think about it. Anyways, I'll move on and Sasha will come up and he can tell you how you actually use these features at Visa in production. Thanks, Mark. All right. So I don't have to give an intro about Visa. It's everywhere you want to be. You guys know. <laughs> so, um, the clicker. It's out of battery. All right. Um, let me give you a quick background about you know uh, Docker, how we brought in Docker into Visa. Um, so we started looking into Docker in 2015, um, and then after a year, in late 2016, we went live. Um, so this is not about a core Visa Net application that takes care of all the Visa payment transactions. This is um, the application um, that does payment processing for a variety of uh, e-commerce companies globally. Um, it's been in production for the past six months. Um, we started with you know, 100, 100 containers. You know, it has the ability, you know, scalability capacity up to 800 to 1,000 containers. Um, two data centers across U.S., um, you know, multiple clusters across two regions. Um, so you could, right from this slide, you could ask me a question, you know, wh what took you guys so long? It's been a year. You started looking at it in 2015. You went live in 2016, right? Um, but looking at how we handle things, you know, the, the bar said, you heard Swami talking uh, this morning. Th that is how these guys set the bar really high. Um, I don't know if any of you know about Visa's core system availability. The core system has been... Um, running with zero downtime for the past two decades. Yes, two decades, not two years, right? Um, that's kind of a level of expectation this guy set on certain applications, not all applications, right? Um, so with all that, you know, any application we look into, we run into a lot of those challenges. So I'm just highlighting a few of those challenges that we had, I mean, the critical ones. Um, talking about security, Visa is obviously paranoid about security. You know, um, security is kind of a job number one for us. Um, so we have very concrete requirements set for every single piece of software and hardware we have in our ecosystem. So that means every single piece would need to meet those requirements before it goes live. So when we started looking into Docker, it did not meet some of those requirements we already had. In a sense, it had other mitigating controls that we had to update. We had to discuss and change things so that you know, we can bring Docker into our ecosystem. Um, the other thing is infrastructure. You know, the whole industry started with physical servers a few decades ago, and then the virtualization revolution came in. Everybody virtualized. Um, we don't have our core systems on public cloud. We have our own private cloud. And the whole infrastructure is based on virtualized um, models. So what this means is when we wanted to have physical servers for Docker, we had to really justify with the rationale behind the benefits of uh, Docker running in physical servers instead of uh, running those in um, VMs. I mean, it doesn't make sense to run Docker in VMs in production, right? You lose some of the benefits Docker offers. Um, so that, that is, again, months of discussions, you know, justification, and 
getting a buy-in from infrastructure team. The variety of teams in Visa, right? It's a large corporate. Um, again, the tools. You know, I'm sure everyone had been working with the CI, CD tools and how you automate things in your agile process, right? So there are so many such, to, you know, every single stage of in your uh, SDLC, you need to change things to accommodate your Docker um, ecosystem and see how you can, you know, get things done the same we have done with the traditional way of uh, uh, application development, right? Um, operational tool is another dimension that brings the complexity on how you manage things. So all these were a top challenges that we had, which took us a year to really get to production. Right? Um, now, based on all this, you, the other question you could ask, like, why did you guys go for Docker? What really made you guys to think about this? You know, we had our our own goals. Just rewinding a little bit, you know, it, um, it's not that our applications were not scalable, not you know, um, working well. So we are looking at year-over-year year year growth, you know, double-digit growth on the traffic that we get into our system. And we also see, you know, the incremental changes that we have done for the past decade. You know, you, you don't really take a chances or opportunity to revamp or redesign the whole platform every time you have a business requirement. You tend to do incremental changes, some of the applications becomes larger over the period, then you get to a state, yeah, I need to do the refactor across the board, right? So that's how we are in a state, we, we can't go with this state for another decade, so we need to take the opportunity to refactor to a very different architecture now, right? So we came up with these goals. These are, again, highlights of the goals with many more line items with what we had. Um, so microservices, I mean, not to mention that every single line item, this goal is kind of a um, difference of opinion that you may have, right? Um, I may have a definition for microservices which would differ from what you already have, right? Mm -hmm. um, likewise, uh, scalability and operational simplicity and all such things. So we decided to go with microservices based on our definition, and we decided to have a dynamic scalability. You know, our transaction traffic is like, you know, it's fluctuating. Um, unlike many of the other companies, it's uh, varying in degrees. Uh, seasonal, you know, different uh, bursts out of uh, marketing from different companies, you know, all impacts our traffic pattern, right? So we wanted to have the ability how we can dynamically scale. Um, and we wanted to simplify all these operational um, tasks that we do. But when it comes to operational tasks, you think about how we apply patches, how we apply you know, any of uh, the changes to your application. Um, what happens today is like, you know, um, I would say for the past few years, the malicious user's world, the hacker's world, is getting really sophisticated. So what makes this um, to do in your environment is like you need to have the ability to quickly push the changes, the patches into your environment. So you can't take time. You need even to apply proactive or preventive measures, you, you need the ability to, you know, what, with a push of a button, I want to have all these patches applied in Linux OS, you know, JVM, whatever you call, right? Um, with the current setup, we did automate to an extent. We do have, you know, scripts automated that pushes things, but still, you run into issues. Still, there is some time taken by all these to push any of the patches. So we wanted to see the ability to, you know, push these things like, you know, the, the Docker. Um, benefits of you have everything in your image except the host. Yeah, th there is another way to do that in the host too. Um, um, so you, that's another simplicity we're looking at. Um, the last one, load balancer less architecture. So this is what load balancer less doesn't mean that we do not want to have load balancer capability at all. In a microservices architecture, absolutely, you need to have the load balancing capability. But what we don't want to have is 
the complexity of managing the load balancing configurations, like you may have a device or you may have a proxy um, that has all those load balancing configurations to the instances of your services, right? Because anytime you say I'm in microservices, or you, even a typical SOA, right? You will have a service cluster. On the service cluster is load balanced by a load balancer. You will have a web that, you know, gives you um, the load balancing capability. So to eliminate all those complexities, we wanted to go to that, you can see the right side of the diagram that eliminates those complexity logically, right? So that means the application, who, whichever wants to talk to the other application within your ecosystem should know which instance it needs to talk to, at least transfer into that application, right? That's our goal. Um, so to achieve this, we decided, yes, Docker fits in well. We have um, analyzed how Docker simplifies every single one of them. Besides some of the application changes we had to do to fit into this um, model, right? Um, so based on the first gen Docker container networking, we decided to go with certain tools to achieve what we wanted. So if you look at this, Yes, Docker gives you the ability to schedule containers. Now, without a load balancer routing your traffic through another um, software or proxy software like HAProxy, Nginx, whatever it is, how would you get this done, right? So we decided to go with console, registrator. This is pretty much you know, um, standard practices that people use today. Um, so registrator helps us to register the services, and service discovery is done using console DNS agent. And we didn't go for a console template and HA proxy kind of a model. What we went with is like um, ability to use the console DNS interface to get the load balanced IP whenever we wanted to make a call from application one to application two. Uh, we'll talk about more detail in the next upcoming slides. Uh, basically, this, this is the choice we made to get this done. Um, the another important item I wanted to note is like um, we started using Docker Bridge Driver, not the overlay. When we started, we had the Docker 1.1 that already had the overlay, but we made a choice to go with Bridge because of the maturity of the Bridge Driver. Okay. So this slide, this picture represents our setup, uh, just in regards to how this you know, registration and the flow happens. So if you look at this, you can see every Docker host has console agent and registrator um, that does the registration and does the, uh, gives us the ability to uh, discover services, right? Um, so console server, you also notice another component there, custom lifecycle management. So we built our custom code to do some level of um, lifecycle management. So we'll talk about a little more you know, in detail in the upcoming slides and what Docker offers and what we built. Right? Um, so as you can see, whenever a new service is created, your application container comes up, registrator listens to you, uh, the Docker events, and register that service into console agent. Console agent syncs it up with server, server you know, syncs it up across all other agents. Okay, so once your service is registered, how does the discovery happen, right? So as you can see, um, see the, the colors are a little pale. I don't know if you can see those. Um, pale blue lines, number one and number two. So what happens here after registration, when application one wants to talk to application two, the application one, um, there are multiple ways you can integrate with console DNS service. There are um, DNS kind of a plugin or an API that you can use. So we chose to use the DNS API from our application itself. We built a common framework so that queries DNS agent from console, hey, give me the next available um, application two instance. Um, so then it gets the, uh, the next available instance. It knows the exact port and IP of that service, then calls that service. Um, 
So this is pretty much the setup, and like, it's nothing new from many of the folks who have been um, building with first gen Docker, even some of those with the second gen uh, Docker. So we see certain problem with this first gen architecture. If you look at this, console, registrator, they're really good tools, proven tools. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. But there is some complexity that we have introduced in our platform. If you look at that, you know, we needed to manage multiple components. Yes, Docker manages those instances, but when it comes to, we need to manage those console agent and registrator ourselves. In every single host, you have to have this. This is even before the global container came into picture, right? So you have to manage these containers explicitly in every single host. You need to make sure these are healthy and available so that your application to application communication happen within your ecosystem. Now, beyond that, what if that goes down? So when it comes to a 4959 available system, you need to make sure this console agent registrator is not really going down. You need to keep them healthy. You need to make sure even if it goes down, bring it back up. So we need to build some custom glue code listening to their health of that system pinging. Yeah, is it there? Because if registrator goes down, if any of uh, new containers scheduled in that host, it's not going to be visible, right? So likewise, if your console agent goes down, if the application one here in one of the hosts wants to talk to the other application, it would be able to find out. I mean, we do have some caching mechanism to mitigate that. So you need to bring all this into picture to get this high availability there. So those are kind of a problems that we are seeing with this architecture. All right, so let's look into the next um, capability that Docker bring in. Mark is going to describe about the second gen. So what Sasha described <clears throat> is, um, is, not, is not unique because the console and registrator deployment model is something that people have been doing for a long time because it works well, it does its job of doing service registration and service discovery for a dynamically scheduled application. So it does this well, except the thing is that service registration and service discovery are fundamental to any application, especially microservices application, when they're across hosts, but also when they're in just a single host as developers are developing multi-container applications that still require these features. And so the Docker network engineering team worked really hard to integrate these features directly into the Docker engine so that they're portable and there when any Docker engine exists. Um, it makes a lot of sense for these features to be there wherever you're using the Docker engine. And so uh, in this picture here, I have a single host with the Docker engine running on it. And every single Docker engine, there is um, a DNS server running. And this is by default turned on that runs whenever you run Docker. There's no extra configuration from your side to do this. And inside every container, there's a DNS listener that will forward requests to the DNS server in the Docker engine. And so when you schedule applications or when you schedule containers on a Docker engine, we instantly propagate the DNS server with, uh, with the identities of the containers so they can find each other. So that app one can resolve the name of app two and receive its IP address. And then also for DNS requests outside to your whatever external DNS service that you have running. And this is great even for, for just a single Docker engine, this works for you. Now this also extends nicely across to, orchest uh, to orchestrated and clustered environments. For instance, in a multi-host scenario, if you have a Docker engine that's clustered together in a swarm, we automatically create a network control plane for you. And this is, again, is done without any intervention from you. And so when this is created, you may create services on top of your swarm. And every service container gets a DNS entry, of course, corresponding to the IP address that it has. But furthermore, and what's really important and critical to know is that every service also gets a virtual IP. And this virtual IP is load balanced internally by Docker in the host. And so without any extra configuration, a VIP exists for every single service that load balances between services that you have in your swarm. To take that one step further, in Docker 112, we introduced the health check. And so now you can configure a health check for your applications, some URL or, or anything that you're using to check the status of your application inside the container. 
And the Docker engine will, by default, check the health and then send that back to the cluster and so the cluster is aware of the health of any of your containers. So that if a service goes down, well then the cluster is aware of it, it can remove it from the Docker load balancer and then so that service isn't contacted anymore and then the service will be rescheduled depending on whatever scheduling, whatever scheduling policy you set for it. And so this is really powerful for, because we're managing the entire application lifecycle just with a single engine or across a swarm cluster without you doing any additional configuration. And so this is good for applications that might die and, or freeze up or hosts that die or putting hosts into maintenance mode to get containers off of them. The life cycle through all these steps is managed by Docker without anything from your side. And now Sashi's going to talk about how they use some of these pieces at Visa. Thanks, Mark. All right, so we didn't choose you know, Docker because it's a shiny new object, right? We knew what we are getting into. So it's a evolution. We need to keep working with the team. We need to um, get to a state where it can be solid, it can be you know, um, highly available and meets all our requirements. So looking at the Oh man, I'm having trouble with this. Okay, so this is the choice we made earlier with first gen, right? So now, looking at the capabilities that Docker described, you know, we have options to see how we can take advantage of those newer capabilities built into the Docker itself, not necessarily using other tools out in the market, right? So scheduling, yes, UCP takes care of it. And service registration, it's built into your Docker engine itself. That's because in the new version of Docker, you have the ability to define your service and you have the ability to define you know, um, load balancing characteristics. It, it's default, you have the web defined as part of your service definition. And the discovery is also provided by your Docker engine DNS, um, DNS ser service itself, right? And the other important thing I wanted to um, note here is it is on the overlay network. These are built on the rails of overlay, right? With, so we also decided to switch to overlay to take advantage of all these capabilities and the other information, that, I mean, the other um, advantages that overlay brings. Um, so if you look at all these load balancing capabilities, you know, it's logically that's nothing new. It's pretty much the same software defined load balancing capability that you would get out of any of those tools, right? But what this gives you is like, you don't really have to manage console agent, you don't have to manage registrator yourself, right? You don't, you're free of managing such tools. You're relying on the same piece of software that is managing your instance. Isn't that really good? It's a good option, right? So we decided to go with that. So it takes care of keeping that you know, highly available. So um, because if your engine is down, although yeah, there's a capability your container can still up, which means your core system that takes care of your application containers uh, is also providing you all these you know, load balancing capabilities and service discovery, you know. So, um, so with the service definition, that's built in registry, you define a name for your web, which is what your application is gonna use to discover the other service within your ecosystem. I mean, obviously there are multiple other options. We're just gonna focus on um, this problematic area, right? So there's a variety of um, ways you can configure, like exposing port, you know, exposing external services, all the you know, ingress, egress network that um, Mark talked about. Um, specific to this, when the application wants to talk to application two, yes, all you use is um, web. Look at this picture now. It it's becomes nicer, you know, with, uh, yeah, less colorful, not much of red in there, red, orange, but still, um, the component you manage becomes much simpler. You worry about only your business applications, not 
a infrastructure. There is no load balancer here too, right? There is a capability exist, but there is no explicit load balancer that you need to worry about. Um, so what happens here is like um, your, the configuration is transparent to your applications. You don't really um, worry about you get me the next available IP calling a uh, console agent. Within console too, you can really define um, those integrated console uh, like a, a transparent um, DNS um, agent, right? Um, but we went with a different mechanism for a reason. So we also do some custom lifecycle management in the earlier um, version um, because you know you need to manage your instances. What if something goes down? Let's see your application goes down for a whatever reason, right? Um, what happens is you need to know, yes, my application went down. The console, we, we implemented using console watch, you know, we get the um, um, trigger, yes, the application is down, then we spin up another instance, right? So with this newer architecture, what Docker gives you is the built-in capability to auto-recover your service. So what this means is if your application two, for example, is down for whatever reason, Docker takes care of bringing your application up, either in the same instance, same worker node, or another worker node. So in your definition, you might have already said I wanted to have these like 10 instances of this service, or this container. For, the, for example, here, for application two, I say two replicas. So now, all Docker knows is like if any time it sees lower than the set number, it's gonna bring up that many number of instances, again, based on health checks, a standard uh, practice in the load balancing industry, right, um, capability. So that's another cool feature that took away some of your, you know, our own, you know, custom implementations. All right, so talking about this connectivity, if you look at um, the Docker bridge driver, you know, every time, I mean, obviously you can set fixed ports, but you would quickly run out of ports. So y y the better option is to let the Docker decide the random ports, and then you use the ports. Um, so that's why we needed to go for, you know, service registry and registering the port, you know, all such things. And overlay simplifies that a lot. Um, I'm sure you guys have gone to some of the Black Belt sessions that um, the uh, Docker networking team had, um, had la yesterday, I guess, uh, Madhu. There was, um, so it's pretty much, you know, taking advantage of that capability here. So overlay simplifies a lot. You just have, um, you configure your overlay network, in your, your application to have the fixed port that is mapped to the actual physical port. I don't really have to go into the details of it. You guys know pretty much all that. So the end is, like we discussed, you know, the advantage we get is like fewer components to manage. That simplifies or operational capabilities that also gives us the, you know, high availability goals, you know, um, meets, it's easier to troubleshoot. If you look at the earlier first gen architecture, you know, that if anything goes wrong in the communication from application one to application, you need to figure out where did this really fail? Did the console agent fail? Registrator failed to come up to register my service? What happened where, right? So that troubleshooting issues are going away with this. I mean, obviously you may argue, yes, the same number of components exist here, but your troubleshooting mechanism becomes really consistent with the same set of tools produced by same set of uh, uh, folks, right? Um, it gives you better visibility. You know where to look into, not like three different tools. Um, and again, some of uh, the custom glue code goes away, right? Um, so you don't really have to build those custom components. You know, you can focus more on your business. Um, with that, you also have um, additional integrated capabilities. Um, we have load balancing that we talked about. You know, that's something that 
you know, backbone for all of these discussions we talked, um, we had here. That's pretty much it. So there's um, there's lots of resources thank for you. Docker. Oh, thank you, Sashi. There's lots of resources for Docker, so I would implore you guys to check some of them out. Um, Docker Labs is one great resource on GitHub, as well as success.docker.com, which has some excellent reference architectures for networking, storage, security, CI pipeline. Go there and check it out. Um, and then lastly, don't forget to vote for the session if you liked it. Um, if you didn't like it, don't vote. Um, I've got some side bets going, and I really, really need this, so please go ahead and vote. <laughs> I hope you guys learned something, and uh, we'll open it up for questions. But thank you, Sashi. Thank you. There's a mic over here, by the way. Hello. Could you uh, describe your underlay network and uh, both within the data center and also the WAN links in between data centers? So we have you know, well-defined subnets for each region, um, if that's what you're asking for. Like, you know, it's a physical network um, with virtual you know, VLANs based on our own um, definitions. Again, um, can give you more details. It's our I mean, specific like questions. Layer two, uh, it's layer two, the data yeah. center, and then MPLS in between them, or? But I'm just curious about any details about the actual infrastructure part of the network. There's probably um, a lot of I don't of know details. how much I can discuss about it, but <laughs> so I'm kind of hesitating to say. It's a pretty typical multi data center setup and within our data center we do have you know completely isolated networks for application groups and also platforms as well. We call it as a pod all secure parts with the different firewalls around it. Um, if you really need more depth of uh, information here, you need to come through proper channels. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Hey, uh, question. So those uh, second gen network architecture features uh, Sashi mentioned in his slides, uh, how much of that is exclusively only in the enterprise edition, and how much of that is available out of the box in the community? Yeah, so actually, 100% um, uh, of that is um, part of Swarm. So you could take Docker CE right now and use it. Uh, so as much as I love the simplicity of getting rid of console and things like that for service discovery, how are you doing service discovery for things that are not running in Swarm? So if something in Swarm needs to talk to something outside of Swarm, how are you finding it? So for services outside of Docker ecosystem, we already have you know, the typical SOS setup. We do have load balancers in front of it. So all you need is the DNS for that service, right? Um, we're not, until we move them into the Docker ecosystem, you're gonna use the typical uh, communication channels. So your services in Swarm just have a hard-coded load balancer to the service they need to talk to, or what? How are they finding that other thing? So um, we use console for configuration properties. Console server is not going away. Okay. It Got does it. play a very important role in our ecosystem. Yep. Right. This, the capability that we are taking out of console like the service discovery and service registration mm -hmm. is something that we do not want to use for this Docker ecosystem, and we would use rather the Docker's built-in capability. Got it. But the co console's configuration management is still there. Yep. We, what we do is like that VIP name we talked about is configured with a key value in console. So when our service needs to call from application one to application two, it gets that VIP from console property. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could compare the performance of the bridge network versus the overlay network that you saw. So it's a virtual mapping. I would probably get more details uh, if you're looking for a performance difference. We haven't measured the performance yet, but we don't see the, um, much of a performance. The second gen is not in production yet. So we're working on doing this performance testing and security testing on top of all yeah. this. 
Docker's done some performance testing, and um, with both bridge and overlay, we're re rewriting the packet. And we, even with, with overlay, there's some load balancing going on. And so both are going to be obviously slower than using host mode or Mac VLAN. Um, but overlay performance is pretty, is pretty on par with bridge, but a little bit slower. Like 1% slower, or like 10% slower, or like 50% slower? I, I think it was within the 50% range than okay. bridge. <laughs> as far as latency is concerned. So from the discussion, we had the same question. So from the discussions we had, um, the kind of a, the difference is you would see, you know, microseconds. When it comes to your internet traffic, um, how much of a compromise that you can make for the flexibility is something that you, you need to make a decision on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What are you guys using for DNS? And also, related question, are you looking into NFV products to run in Docker at some point in the future? Where you are with that? But for DNS, just, for, just do for you DNS? DNS service? Yeah. Do you have your own DNS service? We have our own DNS servers in our data centers. Hardware? Yeah. Yep. So ours is, we're not running in public cloud. We have our own private cloud. Yep. We have complete setup. And you just integrate to whatever is there, right? Got it. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take two more questions, and then we'll we'll take all the questions off to the side. All right. Hey, um, does this uh, swarm load balancer support the stickiness? Sorry, say it again. Uh, is there any stickiness capability in this uh, swarm load balancer? Oh, stickiness. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so in the the version that we're using here, it's all, it's round robin. Although there's a la layer seven load balancer that's part of the enterprise edition that does include stickiness. All right. Thanks. Yep. Uh, that might have probably answered my question, but uh, my question was, uh, how do you route traffic to applications already running in Swarm from an external load balancer? So, so one method is is using the layer seven load balancer that you include and then you set DNS name for it or URL for it. And you can set that in the, in the configuration for Compose. Oh, and that's part of the uh, Enterprise Edition? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.